Okay, it's now just about 22 minutes before 11 o'clock on WATR. Ben Zimmer, who has been with us before the, from the Connecticut Policy Institute, is back one more time here on WATR. Good to see you, Ben. Great to see you, too. And uh, we'll remind people about the Connecticut Policy Institute. At this point, uh, Daniela Rohr is with us, and she is a fellow at the Institute. And uh, you're at Yale Law School now? That's correct, yes. Okay, great. And, uh, Ben, just remind us about the Policy Institute and what kind of work you're doing. Yep, we're a nonpartisan think tank focused on Connecticut economic policy and education reform. And the idea is to focus on areas where long-term good policy may diverge from politician self-interest and where data-driven analysis may diverge from ideology of, of any kind. Okay, well, anytime we can get there, uh, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> With all that said, you're looking into a whole host of issues. Last time we had you on, it was to talk about all the uh, benchmarking that you did to look at where the state of Connecticut is economically, socially, and so forth. And I thought it was very instructive and illuminating. Today we're here to talk about a particular issue that uh, you think uh, has uh, some resonance. And I will tell you that the Republican Party here in the city of Waterbury, uh, they put together about 19 points. I mean, they're out of power. Uh, what they would do if they could attain power. And one of the issues was, uh, you know, this uh, voucher opportunity for kids within a public school uh, sphere uh, to be able to get choice uh, for their uh, schooling options. And this is something that, of course, is, uh, you know, something that's been discussed. I know there's a big program in New Orleans. There was a piece yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. Vouchers can help kids and big city politicians, too, talking about Chicago. Now, some would ask, what is the difference between just a general voucher system, which allows uh, kids to go anywhere, versus a public school voucher system? Who would like to take that one? I can go ahead and take sure. that. I think um, the general voucher system that's often discussed would allow students to leave the public school system and enter private schools or independent schools. Um, in terms of the what we're talking about, which is public school choice within the public school system, students aren't actually leaving any public school system. They're staying within public education that's government funded, and nobody is leaving the system in favor of a private option. Okay, so that uh, argument, well, you're going to make uh, you know these second-class schools, all the folks who have the resources are going to move out of it and leaving only the poor in it. That uh, rebuts uh, that particular argument. Exactly. Okay. Now, what is the uh, range that you're looking at? I mean, from the standpoint is it uh, that uh, somebody say the city of Waterbury as one jurisdiction that uh, all the kids could go only within that jurisdiction in terms of choice I mean as you've looked at this or would there be a bigger pool could they team up with uh, suburban communities and uh, do it that way so that would help with integration and a whole range of other issues socially Right. The idea is to create as many options as possible. So, of course, options within the jurisdiction, within Waterbury. Um, but Connecticut's districts are very small, um, and there aren't there isn't very there aren't very many choices within each district. Um, so, ideally, the idea would be for students in Waterbury to be able to go to neighboring towns, to suburban towns, to neighboring cities um, through more of an open choice model, which. That model has been adopted in Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport. Students in those areas have the opportunity to participate in this open choice program, um, and the idea would be to extend that to all students in Connecticut. Okay. How many are taking advantage of that? If you've used that as something of a model, and I believe that was part of uh, Chef versus O'Neill in Hartford, yes. um, you know, tell us how well that's been working as an indicator of what uh, you're looking at, what we might see in a larger context. It's been working quite well in Connecticut. The program, specifically in Hartford, um, has been expanded over the years, and many students are taking advantage of it. It's also, um, we've looked at a bunch of other states that have implemented it on a state le statewide level. Uh, Wisconsin, for example, has a full open choice program throughout the whole state, and they've seen quite positive results. There, There is obviously the concern that students leaving certain school, the schools that people are leaving will see lower results because so many students are leaving. But in fact, what Wisconsin has showed is that not only are the receiving school districts seeing improvements, the school districts that are sending students away are also seeing improvement, we believe, because it's pushing them to improve their own practices. Okay, so either you, um, you know, do better or you fade away. I mean, I mean, some schools could likely in this scenario go out of business. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right. 
but I think the the bigger you know one of the ideas of a of a choice program like this is that you empower parents and make uh, school districts and school principals more accountable to those parents. And as we've seen, you know, in Connecticut and around the country, actually. You know, in, in some cases, schools do, you know, get shut down and replaced with new schools. But in many other cases, like Danielle was saying in Wisconsin, you see the schools actually not shutting down, but getting their act together and improving teacher professional development. Um, you know, eliminating wasteful spending so that it can be redirected towards, you know, more productive educational uses. Um, you know, whatever it, it takes, you know, developing in, innovative use of technology in the school, whatever it is, when they face that pressure, they So in a sense, they, they have to make themselves, um, you know, a, a marketing uh, machine because they've got to tell you what the advantages are. I mean, today, a school really, I mean, doesn't have to. I mean, if, in fact, it's all based on where you live and so forth, uh, you're basically subject to geography more than you are, uh, you know, the value of the programs that are available there. I mean, you can fight for better programs as a parent, but uh, that's not something you really have a lot of choice in. Exactly. And I mean, certainly, you know, parents do fight fight for that, sure. and there is improvement, but, you know, to have, when, when you're a school and a, a family leaving means that your funding is going to be reduced, you know, that's really when the rubber hits the road, and now, you Now, isn't that a problem we've together. got in the state of Connecticut? I mean, uh, aside from, you know, the um, historical precedent where everybody thinks that this is the way the system should work and has worked for years, and I'm sure there are a lot of internal audiences within the educational system who might uh, reject uh, some of these notions just because, you know, they're foreign to us. Uh, the question is, what about uh, the funding model in the state of Connecticut? We don't have it now where the money follows the child, do we? No, that's right. The, the funding model in Connecticut now is, as we say in the paper, uh, centered around bureaucracies, not students. So the state um, you know, takes a lot of money and then basically allocates it to school districts, but doesn't exercise any discretion over how those districts spend the money. So within districts, you often see asymmetries. And also, the the funding for each district is based on the number of students living there, not the number of students actually in the school. So say in New Haven, if a school, if a student leaves New Haven for an inter-district magnet school or for a, a school outside as part of one of these programs uh, that Danielle was talking about, the money, you know, that district doesn't get any less money. So, in fact, schools are <laughs> rewarded. You know, you they get do better. they do better. They get more per pupil funding when schools leave, and meanwhile, when students leave, rather. And meanwhile, you then have many low income, high poverty students who are receiving less money uh, for their education than than other students. So, the system we have is both ineffective at creating the right incentives, but also is inequitable in terms of making sure each student has access to to, you know, the same amount of, of money needed for their education. Okay, now let me ask you, Daniela, in the introduction to your, your report on this, you say one impediment to systematic improvement in Connecticut's public schools is the state's hostile attitude towards public school choice, and yet we do have it in some of our major cities. Where do you see that hostility, or how has that been evidenced? Um, it's been evidenced, as you mentioned, there is, the choice does exist in certain areas. It but it does exist primarily only in three, only in Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven. So there hasn't been real effort to expand the programs. Um, we also see some level of resistance in the charter school context. Um, while the state does allow for charter schools. Very few, though. Very few, because the process, the application and approval process is very onerous. It's a dual process. It requires not only the school board, but the state legislator to approve um, the school and the funding, and it weeds many potential educational providers out in the process. Um, and that, that process is actually not mirrored across the country. Most other states have a much more streamlined process that allow these schools, which are just another form of choice, 
to flourish. And where do charter schools fit into the construct that you're developing here for public school choice? I mean, where does that fit in? Give us a sense of what the choices would be available in a robust public school choice program that you've seen in Wisconsin and other places. Sure. So it would be ju- it would be one other option in the larger portfolio. So it would be the traditional public district public school would be one option. A traditional public school in a neighboring or nearby area would be one option. A nearby charter school would be an option. Um, you know, we see many higher income families with the options. They have private schools as an option. They have the opportunity to move to a different district as an option. And for many families in Connecticut and across the country, the oppor- those opportunities don't exist. And so to provide multiple options that are available to them would give them a similar opportunity. Would the first thing that we could do in the state of Connecticut, even within the urban districts, because let's be honest about it, I mean, there are a lot of people in Greenwich or in Easton who say, well, you know, I mean, what, what do I need? Choice. I've got great schools. I'm funding them to, you know, the, the, the max. Uh, I like the way this is working. So they are going to have some uh, kind of rejectionist uh, notion about this. So it's really in the urban areas. The question is, could we benefit, and maybe some of the inner ring suburbs, could we benefit at first by trying to give people choices even within a particular school district alone just to start the process so that if there is really a failing school, and don't forget today is a pretty auspicious day to be having this conversation because uh, the governor's folks are meeting with those schools that are part of the commissioner's network. Uh, Those are schools, we've got a couple of them here in Waterbury, Walsh and our Crosby High School, that are really uh, having trouble academically. So if people wanted to move from those schools to others, at least in the interim, until we got a broader set of choices available to them. I mean, look at the exchange here in Connecticut now, the health care. We've got three choices. We're waiting for Cigna and Aetna and others to jump in later on, but there is at least some level of choice. Could that work as an interim step or at least a beginning step? It could definitely work as as a beginning step. Um, just choice within the district. As I mentioned before, the problem that inevitably many districts will run into is that there just aren't that many choices in the districts. Some districts are as small as having only one or two schools of it, public schools available. Um, so in the interim, I agree. I think it's a nice first step. I would hope that down the line we could expand it further. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'd love to see if there are any questions. We've got a lot of retired uh, educators who listen to the program, I know. Uh, and any uh, comments that you have about choice, 203-757-1320. I guess inevitably, I mean, if you want to look at all the logistical you know, uh, setbacks that one could face in uh, promoting one of these uh, concepts. What about transportation? Where does that all fit in? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a key factor. And one of the things we try to emphasize in the paper is it's not just about more choice, but it's about doing it right. And, you know, transportation is is key to that, if, especially with low-income families, if you're going to be... Um, you know, if you're going to be encouraging them to to go to schools that aren't necessarily right where they live, you do have to pay for the transportation. And so, you know, we would advocate, um, you know, that as as part of this program, the state would would cover the transportation okay. of of students. Okay. And I know they've been trying to get the calendar year for the schools somewhat in alignment to save some money to bulk uh, buy some transportation services. So that might work well in that regard. Let me ask you another question. We do have minimum expenditure requirements uh, here in the state of Connecticut. And if you fall below those, you have trouble with your uh, state grants uh, and so forth. But, you know, there are certain communities that spend a whole lot more, either because they've got kids with very special needs or because they've got the tax base in order to do that. What happens in that case when a kid is moving out of a school district uh, that is spending 17000 a year into one that's spending either twenty or twelve or what have you? How do you account for those disparities? Well, so so there's two things I would say. The first is, and this is kind of a big misconception out there, is in today's Connecticut, this was not true 15, 20 years ago, the five wealthiest districts spend about as much per student as the five poorest districts. So although there are vast inequalities, those are more random and based on sort of artificial bureaucratic reasons than based on, on wealth. 
but you know the the challenge that obstacle to to choice still remains and that's one of the reasons why to come back to where we started kind of the key to this whole picture is the funding model and why we would say at a statewide level this we should have this money follows the child system where basically the state says each student there's a certain amount of money that it costs to educate each student and you can weight that for certain things like special needs students would get you know more and then you say whichever public school that student attends that per pupil funding will be allocated towards them and so then when you have someone say moving from you know a school uh, a school in Waterbury to another school in Waterbury a school in Waterbury to a school in a nearby town that per pupil funding would would travel with them and that's a much kind of more you know, easier and efficient way to make to make this work, and the lack of a system like that is one of the big obstacles. Um, you know, we would talk about well, let me ask in the you, state. We're, we're continuing to look at educational funding in the state of Connecticut. There was a commission set up to look at the uh, ECS, uh, you know, grant program. There is a lawsuit potentially uh, that uh, may go forward about not only providing access but also a quality education. I mean, there are a whole range of things going on, and then you've got the political history of the state, which uh, doesn't really love a lot of this cross-border activity. Let's be honest about it. And uh, in the cases that you were talking about with New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford, Hartford by Chef versus O'Neill, how did the others come to an agreement uh, with their suburban communities? And uh, is it a very limited program? Because, you know, again, I could see where there could be more experimentation, but I see Connecticut being very reluctant uh, to tear down all the walls uh, because they've been built for a reason, at least uh, this exclusionary approach in Connecticut. I mean, you know that this is a political hot potato in many ways. Right. Um, with respect to Bridgeport and New Haven, particularly, they were classified by the state as high-priority districts. They were f- many failing schools. There's many students in the districts. And so they were actually mandated by the state to participate in this program. Okay, so it came from mandation, yeah. Yeah, okay. um, it's a mandatory inter-district open enrollment program, whereas other states, by statute, are entitled to participate voluntarily. So it's up to the district, or their districts, excuse me, are entitled to participate voluntarily, whereas Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven are required to participate. Um, and their neighboring districts okay. are required so to are accept. The, what are the carrots? I mean, obviously, you know, if the money could follow the child, that's one. But if a school district said, well, gee, if we're going to start uh, taking a lot of kids who really want to go across the border for one reason or another, uh, they're going to bring with them special needs, uh, more uh, different types of specialties that we're going to have to provide. Uh, it's going to mean more of an onus uh, on our local school system. If they are not required to do it, uh, what do you think? I mean, in the state of Connecticut, you've been around, Ben. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think what's important to remember is that a lot of these districts, even the ones that aren't the poorest, are receiving a lot of state funding for education. And so I think it's perfectly within the the purview of the state to say, look, if you want to fund your whole education system locally, then, you know, fine, but, you know, we're not going to mandate it necessarily. But as long as you're a district that's receiving all of this state funding, you know, you need to to implement these policies. And, you know, they are policies that I, I completely agree can be politically challenging, but I think, you know, as the experience in a lot of other states show, there are policies that are win-win, that, that this is... By changing the incentive structure, you're not... It's not a zero-sum game where some schools are getting better and others are getting worse. You're you're creating a system where everyone is pushed to meet parents' needs and thereby elevate the the quality of no, education. I get, I get where yeah. you're going, and you know, look, uh, the state of Connecticut is really the uh, you know entity, uh, the jurisdiction that is responsible for education in the state of Connecticut. They call all the shots, really. So they could do this. Uh, Are you hearing any interest? I mean, has Connecticut been uh, very quiet about any of this uh, public school choice other than in those three areas? Uh, Is there any movement, uh, any legislation that has been put forward? I mean, any movement in this area? I mean, I think think you've seen some. I think... um 
a few sessions ago, a representative Laviel, who's in the uh, in the House of Representatives here, had introduced a bill around money follows the child. Um, you know, I think obviously, as you were saying before, in education policy, as in a lot of policy, there can just be inertia. You know, this is the way we've always done it, and so I think you know part of our goal with papers like this, and there certainly are you know a number of other education organizations who would take a similar view to us. You know, part of the idea is to is to raise awareness and help help inform and engage people. You know, obviously. Um, you know, Governor Malloy's education bill, I think, you know, one of the one of the things I would give him credit for is, you know, putting this issue on the sort of forefront of the political dialogue. I think in terms of the the specifics of what he did, you know, I would have a, I have a, you know, certain certain critiques, but I do I do give him um, him credit for for that for using the sort of bully pulpit of the governor to to sort of put this forward. Well, what will be interesting is that uh, the Speaker of the House has this more commission looking at ways to consolidate various services and the way that they are rendered across the state of Connecticut, looking for some cost efficiencies and uh, some administrative overhang that could be eliminated. And the possibility of this uh, leading uh, to a conversation about public school choice and maybe even collapsing some districts over time. Connecticut Magazine did a piece uh, some months ago saying we should have six school districts in the entire state, and of course that would cause uh, bedlam, we know that. But, you know, I mean, this is an idea that uh, sounds uh, crazy in a state like Connecticut until it becomes more real, and until somebody like Brendan Sharkey or the governor puts an idea like this forward and uh, has us all debating it. But at least your paper gives us something to hang a hat on and to debate debate the issue uh, from. So if people want to get this, Closing Connecticut's Achievement Gap Through Public School Choice, September 18th, 2013. How do they get it, Ben? Um, the best way is to go onto our website, www.ctpolicyinstitute.org, or if you Google Connecticut Policy Institute, it's the first one. And the paper is uh, right on the front of our of our website, um, along with a few of our other recent papers like the uh, scorecard benchmark that we were discussing last month. Okay, so if you forgot to go up and look for that benchmark, it is still there along with this uh, report put together by Daniela Rohr. And I want to thank you, Daniela, thank you. for being here on WATR. And Ben, always uh, good to see you. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And uh, we are going to be going to the news in just a moment. Let me just tell you what the rest of the program looks like. Kevin Rennie will be joining us from uh, Daily Ructions. We're going to be talking about the fact that a lot of people are going solo. They're living alone. And yet, some people don't want to be living alone. Sharing housing today, and then the Y-axis, a new way to look at economics and the way we are motivated. 1320 WATR in Waterbury, it's 11 o'clock. The entire Congress could meet with the President in groups. He's extending the invitation. Fox News Radio's Mike Makowitz live at the White House. The president is doing this by caucus. He's going to start with House Democrats. Now, this comes as Republicans have been demanding for negotiations over the partial government shutdown and the debt ceiling. Wyoming Republican Senator John Barrasso says he's looking forward to the visit. I have specific questions for the president, and they have to do with raising the debt ceiling. You don't get a new credit card without first addressing the problem of spending, and the president has to discuss that. But the president has set reopening the government and resolving the debt ceilings as preconditions to any negotiations. But he did say yesterday that a short-term measure could do the trick. Lisa? Mike, thanks. Veterans want to know whether their disability checks and VI bill benefits uh, will be paid in November. Florida Congressman Jeff Miller chairs the House committee that's hearing a warning from VA Secretary Eric Shinseki. If the shutdown does not end in the coming weeks, VA will not be able to assure delivery of one November checks to more than 5.18 million beneficiaries. Death benefits for the families.